Chapter Four of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Corbett. The spring that followed the visit to London passed uneventfully at Great Keynes to all outward appearances, and yet for Isabel they were significant months. In spite of herself and of the word of warning from her father, her relations with Hubert continued to draw closer. For one thing, he had been the first to awaken in her the consciousness that she was lovable in herself, and the mirror that first tells that to a soul always has something of the glow of the discovery resting upon it. Then again his deference and his chivalrous air had a strange charm. When Isabel rode out alone with Anthony, she often had to catch the swinging gate as he rode through after opening it and do such little things for herself. But when Hubert was with them, there was nothing of that kind. And, once more, he appealed to her pity. And this was the most subtle element of all. There was no doubt that Hubert's relations with his fiery old father became strained sometimes, and it was extraordinarily sweet to Isabel to be made a confidant. And yet Hubert never went beyond a certain point, his wooing was very skilful, and he seemed to be conscious of her uneasiness almost before she was conscious of it herself, and to relapse in a moment into frank and brotherly relations again. He came in one night after supper, flushed and bright-eyed, and found her alone in the hall, and broke out immediately, striding up and down as she sat and watched him. "'I cannot bear it!' there is mr bailey who has been with us all lent he is always interfering in my affairs and he has no charity i know i am a catholic in that but when he and my father talk against the protestants mistress isabel i cannot bear it they were abusing the queen to-night at least he added for he had no intention to exaggerate they were saying she was a true daughter of her father and sneers of that kind and i am an englishman and her subject and i said so and mr bailey snapped out and you are also a catholic my son and then and then i lost my temper and said that the catholic religion seemed no better than any other for the good it did people and that the rector and mr norris seemed to me as good men as any one and of course i meant him and he knew it, and then he told me, before the servants, that I was speaking against the faith, and then I said, I would sooner speak against the faith than against good Christians, and then he flamed up scarlet, and I saw I had touched him, and then my father got scarlet too, and my mother looked at me, and my father told me to leave the table for an insolent puppy, I, and I knocked over my chair and stamped out, and oh mistress isabel i came straight here and he flung down astride of a chair with his arms on the back and dropped his head on to them it would have been difficult for hubert even if he had been very clever indeed to have made any speech which would have touched isabel more than this there was the subtle suggestion that he had defended the protestants for her sake and there was the open defence of her father and defiance of the priests whom she feared and distrusted. There was a warm generosity and frankness running through it all, and lastly there was the sweet flattering implication that he had come to her to be understood and quieted and comforted. Then, when she tried to show her disapproval of his quick temper, and had succeeded in showing a poorly disguised sympathy instead, he had flung away again, saying that she had brought him to his senses as usual, and that he would ask the priest's pardon for his insolence at once. And Isabel was left standing and looking at the fire, and fearing that she was being wooed, and yet not certain, though she loved it. And then, too, there was the secret hope that it might be through her, that he might escape from his superstitions, and... And then... And she closed her eyes and bit her lip for joy and terror, she did not know that a few weeks later hubert had an interview with his father of which she was the occasion 
lady maxwell had gone to her husband after a good deal of thought and anxiety and told him what she feared asking him to say a word to hubert sir nicholas had been startled and furious it was all the lad's conceit he said he had no real heart at all he only flattered his vanity in making love he had no love for his parents or his faith and so on she took his old hand in her own and held it while she spoke sweetheart she said how old were you when you used to come riding to overfield i forget and there came peace into his angry puzzled old eyes and a gleam of humour mistress he said you have not forgotten for he had been just eighteen too and he took her face in his hands delicately and kissed her on the lips well well he said it is hard on the boy but it must not go on send him to me oh i will be easy with him but the interview was not as simple as he hoped for hubert was irritable and shamefaced and spoke lightly of the religion again after all he burst out there are plenty of good men who have left the faith it brings nothing but misery sir nicholas hands began to shake and his fingers to clench themselves but he remembered the lad was in love my son he said you do not know what you say i know well enough said hubert with his foot tapping sharply i say that the catholic religion is a religion of misery and death everywhere look at the low countries sir i cannot speak of that said his father and his son sneered visibly you and i are but laymen but this i know and have a right to say that to threaten me like that is the act of a is not worthy of my son my dear boy he said coming nearer you are angry and god forgive me so am i but i promised your mother and again he broke off and we cannot go on with this now come again this evening hubert stood turned away with his head against the high oak mantelpiece and there was silence father he said at last turning round i ask your pardon sir nicholas stepped nearer his eyes suddenly bright with tears and his mouth twitching and held out his hand which hubert took and i was a coward to speak like that but but i will try went on the boy and i promise to say nothing to her yet at any rate will that do and i will go away for a while the father threw his arms round him as the summer drew on and began to fill the gardens and meadows with wealth the little italian garden to the southwest of the hall was where my lady spent most of the day here she would cause chairs to be brought out for mistress margaret and herself and a small selection of devotional books an orange leather volume powdered all over with pierced hearts filled with extracts in a clear brown ink another book called le chapelet de jesus while from her girdle beside her pocket mirror there was always hung an olive-coloured hours of the blessed virgin fastened by a long strip of leather prolonged from the binding here the two old sisters would sit in the shadow of the yew hedge taking it by turns to read and embroider or talking a little now and then in quiet voices with long silences broken only by the hum of insects in the hot air or the quick flight of a bird in the tall trees behind the hedge here too isabel often came also bringing her embroidery and sat and talked and watched the wrinkled tranquil faces of the two old ladies and envied their peace hubert had gone as he had promised his father on a long visit and was not expected home until at least the autumn james will be here to-morrow said lady maxwell suddenly one hot afternoon isabel looked up in surprise he had not been at home for so long but the thought of his coming was very pleasant to her and mary corbett too went on the old lady will be here to-morrow 
or the day after isabel asked who this was she is one of the queen's ladies my dear and a great talker she is very amusing sometimes said mistress margaret's clear little voice and mr james will be here to-morrow said isabel yes my child they always suit one another and we have known mary for years and is miss corbett a catholic yes my dear her grace seems to like them about her when isabel went up again to the hall in the evening a couple of days later she found mr james sitting with his mother and aunt in the same part of the garden mr james who rose as she came through the yew archway and stood waiting to greet her was a tall pleasant brown-faced man isabel noticed as she came up his strong friendly face that had something of hubert's look in it and felt an immediate sense of relief from her timidity at meeting this man whose name it was said was beginning to be known among the poets and about whom the still more formidable fact was being repeated that he was a rising man at court and had attracted the queen's favour as they sat down again together she noticed too his strong delicate hand in its snowy ruff for he was always perfectly dressed as it lay on his knee and again thought of hubert's browner and squarer hand we were talking mistress isabel about the play and the new theatres i was at the blackfriars only last week ah and i met buxton there he went on turning to his mother dear henry said lady maxwell he told me when i last saw him that he could never go to london again his religion was too expensive he said mr james white teeth glimmered in a smile he told me he was going to prison next time instead of paying the fine it would be cheaper he thought i hear her grace loves the play said mistress margaret indeed she does i saw her at whitehall the other day when the children of the chapel royal were acting she clapped and called out with delight but mistress corbett can tell you more than i can ah here she is isabel looked up and saw a wonderful figure coming briskly along the terrace and down the steps that led from the house miss corbett was dressed with what she herself would have said was a milkmaid's plainness but isabel looked in astonishment at the elaborate ruff and wings of muslin and lace the shining peacock gown the high piled coils of black hair and the twinkling buckled feet she had a lively bright face a little pale with a high forehead and black arched brows and dancing eyes and a little scarlet mouth that twitched humorously now and then after speaking she rustled up flicking her handkerchief and exclaiming against the heat isabel was presented to her she sat down on a settle mr james drew forward for her with the handkerchief still whisking at the flies i am ashamed to come out like this she began mistress pless would break her heart at my lace you country ladies have far more sense i am the slave of my habits what were you talking of that you look so gravely at me mr james told her oh her grace said miss corbett indeed i think sometimes she is never off the stage herself ah and what art and passion she shows too we are all loyal subjects here said mr james tell us what you mean i mean what i say she said never was there one who loved play acting more and to occupy the centre of the stage too and the throne too if there be one she added miss corbett talked always at her audience she hardly ever looked directly at any one but up or down or even shut her eyes and tilted her face forward while she talked and all the while she kept an incessant movement of her lips or handkerchief or tapped her foot or shifted her position a little isabel thought she had never seen any one so restless then she went on to tell them of the queen she was so startlingly frank that lady maxwell again and again looked up as if to interrupt but she always came off the thin ice in time it was abominable gossip but she talked with such a genial air of loyal good humour that it was very difficult to find fault 
Miss Corbett was plainly accustomed to act as court circular, or even as lecturer and showwoman on the most popular subject in England. But her grace surpassed herself in acting the tyrant last January. You would have sworn her really angry. This was how it fell out. I was in the anteroom one day waiting for her grace when I thought I heard her call, so I tapped. I got no clear answer, but I heard her voice within, so I entered, and there was her majesty sitting a little apart in a chair by herself with the secretary, poor rat, white-faced at the table, writing what she bade him, and looking at her quick and sideways, like a child at a lifted rod, and there was her grace. She had kicked her stool over, and one shoe had fallen, and she was striking the arm of her chair as she spoke, and her rings rapped as loud as a drunken watchman, and her face was all white, and her eyes glaring. And Mary began to glare, and raise her voice, too. And she was crying out, By God's son, sir, I will have them hanged. Tell the but i dare not say what she called my lord sussex but few would have recognized him from what she said tell him that i will have my will done these <laughs> and she called the rebels a name i dare not tell you these men have risen against me these two months and yet they are not hanged hang them in their own villages that their children may see what treason brings all this while i was standing at the open door thinking she had called me but she was as if she saw naught but the gallows and hellfire beyond and i spoke softly to her asking what she wished and she sprang up and ran at me and struck me yes again and again across the face with her open hand rings and all and I ran out in tears. Yes, went on Miss Corbett in a moment, dropping her voice and pensively looking up at nothing. Yes, you would have said she was really angry. So quick and natural were her movements, and so loud her voice. Mr. James' face wrinkled up silently in amusement, and Lady Maxwell seemed on the point of speaking, but Miss Corbett began again and to see her grace act the lover it was a miracle you would have said that our artemis repented of her coldness if you had not known it was but play acting or let us say perhaps a rehearsal if you had seen what i once saw at nonsuch it was on a summer evening and we were all on the bowling green and her grace was within doors not to be disturbed my lord leicester was to come but we thought had not arrived then i had occasion to go to my room to get a little book i had promised to show to caroline and thinking no harm i ran through into the court and there stood a horse his legs apart all steaming and blowing some courier said i to myself and never thought to look at the trappings and so i ran upstairs to go to the gallery across which lay my chamber and i came up and just began to push open the door when i heard her grace's voice beyond and by the mercy of god i stopped and dared not close the door again nor go downstairs for fear i should be heard and there were two walking within the gallery her grace and my lord and my lord was all disordered with hard riding and nearly as spent as his poor beast below and her grace had her arm round his neck for i saw them through the chink and she fondled and pinched his ear and said over and over again robin my sweet robin and then crooned and moaned at him and he whenever he could fetch a breath and oh i promise you he did blow murmured back calling her his queen which indeed she was and his sweetheart and his moon and his star which she was not but was all in the play well again by the favour of god they did not see how the door was open and i couched behind it for the sun was shining level through the west window in their eyes but why they did not hear me as i ran upstairs and opened the door he only knows unless my lord was too sorely out of breath and her grace too intent upon her play-acting well i promise you the acting was so good 
he so spent and she so tender that i nearly cried out brava as i saw them but that i remembered in time twas meant to be a private rehearsal <laughs> but i have seen her grace act near as passionate a part before the whole company sometimes the two old ladies seemed not greatly pleased with all this talk and as for isabel she sat silent and overwhelmed mary corbett glanced quickly at their faces when she had done and turned a little in her seat ah look at that peacock she cried out as a stately bird stepped delicately out of the shrubbery on to the low wall a little way off and stood balancing himself he is loyal too and has come to hear news of his queen he has come to see his cousin from town said mr james looking at miss corbett's glowing dress and to learn of the london fashions mary got up and curtsied to the astonished bird who looked at her with his head lowered as he took a high step or two and then paused again with his burnished breast swaying a little from side to side he invites you to a dance went on mr james gravely a pavan miss corbett sat down again i dare not dance a pavan she said with a real peacock surely said mr james with a courtier's air you are too pitiful for him and too pitiless for us i dare not she said again for he never ceases to practise in hopes said mr james that one day you will dance it with him and then the two went off into the splendid fantastic nonsense that the wits loved to talk that grotesque exaggerated phrasing made fashionable by lily it was like a kind of impromptu sword exercise in an assault of arms where the rhythm and the flash and the graceful turns are of more importance than the actual thrusts received the two old ladies embroidered on in silence but their eyes twinkled and little wrinkles flickered about the corners of their lips but poor isabel sat bewildered it was so elaborate so empty she had almost said so wicked to take the solemn gift of speech and make it dance this wild fandango and as absurdity climbed and capered in a shower of sparks and gleams on the shoulders of absurdity and was itself surmounted and the names of heathen gods and nymphs and demigods and loose living classical women whisked across the stage and were tossed higher and higher until the whole mad erection blazed up and went out in a shower of stars and gems of illusions and phrases like a flight of rockets bright and bewildering at the moment but leaving a barren darkness and dazzled eyes behind the poor little puritan country child almost cried with perplexity and annoyance if the two talkers had looked at one another and burst into laughter at the end she would have understood it to be a joke though to her mind but a poor one but when they had ended and mary corbett had risen and then swept down to the ground in a great silent curtsey and mr james the grave sensible gentleman had solemnly bowed with his hand on his heart and his heels together like a monsieur and then she had rustled off in her peacock dress to the house with her muslin wings bulging behind her and no one had laughed or reproved or explained it was almost too much and she looked across to lady maxwell with an appeal in her eyes mr james saw it and his face relaxed you must not take us too seriously mistress isabel he said in his kindly way it is all part of the game the game she said piteously yes said mistress margaret intent on her embroidery the game of playing at kings and queens and courtiers and roughs and high-stepping mr james's face again broke into his silent laugh you are acid dear aunt he said but began isabel again but it is wrong you think he interrupted to talk such nonsense well mistress isabel i am not sure you are not right and the dancing light in his eyes went out oh, no 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 she cried distressed i did not mean that only i did not understand i know i know and please god you never will and he looked at her with such a tender gravity that her eyes fell isabel is right went on mistress margaret in her singularly sweet old voice 
and you know it, my nephew. It is very well as a pastime, but some folks make it their business, and that is nothing less than fooling with the gifts of the good God. Well, Aunt Margaret, said James softly, I shall not have much more of it. You need not fear for me. Lady Maxwell looked quickly at her son for a moment, and down again. He made an almost imperceptible movement with his head. Mistress Margaret looked across at him with her tender eyes, beaming love and sorrow, and there fell a little eloquent silence, while Isabel glanced shyly from one to the other and wondered what it was all about. Miss Mary Corbett stayed a few weeks, as the custom was when travelling meant so much, but Isabel was scarcely nearer understanding her. She accepted her, as simple, clean souls so often have to accept riddles in this world, as a mystery that no doubt had a significance, though she could not recognize it. So she did not exactly dislike or distrust her, but regarded her silently out of her own candid soul, as one would say a small fearless bird in a nest must regard the man who thrusts his strange hot face into her green pleasant world and tries to make endearing sounds for isabel was very fascinating to mary corbett she had scarcely ever before been thrown so close to any one so serenely pure she would come down to the dower house again and again at all hours of the day rustling along in her silk and seize upon isabel in the little upstairs parlour or her bedroom and question her minutely about her ways and ideas and she would look at her silently for a minute or two together and then suddenly laugh and kiss her isabel's transparency was almost as great a riddle to her as her own obscurity to isabel and sometimes she would throw herself on isabel's bed and lie there with her arms behind her head to the deplorable ruin of her ruff with her buckled feet twitching and tapping and go on and on talking like a running stream in the sun that runs for the sheer glitter and tinkle of it and accomplishes nothing but she was more respectful to isabel's simplicity than at first and avoided dangerous edges and treacherous ground in a manner that surprised herself telling her of the pageants at court and fair exterior of it all and little about the poisonous conversations and jests and the corrupt souls that engaged in them she was immensely interested in isabel's religion tell me child she said one day i cannot understand such a religion it is not like the protestant religion at court at all all that the protestants do there is to hear sermons it is all so dismal and noisy but here with you you have a proper soul it seems to me that you are like a little herb garden very prim and plain but living and wholesome and pleasant to walk in at sunset and these protestants that i know are more like a paved court at noon all hot and hard and glaring they give me the headache tell me all about it of course isabel could not though she tried again and again her definitions were as barren as any others i see said mary corbett one day sitting up straight and looking at isabel it is not your religion but you your religion is as dull as all the rest but your soul is sweet my dear and the wilderness blossoms where you set your feet there is nothing to blush about it's no credit to you but to god isabel hated this sort of thing it seemed to her as if her soul was being dragged out of a cool thicket from the green shadow and the flowers and set stripped in the high road another time miss corbett spoke yet more plainly you are a catholic at heart my dear or you would be if you knew what the religion was but your father good man has never understood it himself and so you don't know it either what you think about us my dear is as much like the truth as as i am like a saint or you like a sinner i'll be bound now that you think us all idolaters isabel had to confess that she did think something of the sort there now what did i say why haven't either of those two old nuns at the hall taught you any better they they don't talk to me about religion 
ah i see or the puritan father would withdraw his lamb from the wolves but if they are wolves my dear you must confess that they have the decency to wear sheep's clothing and that the disguise is excellent and so it gradually came about that isabel began to learn an immense deal about what the catholics really believed far more than she had ever learnt in all her life before from the ladies at the hall who were unwilling to teach her and her father who was unable about halfway through miss corbett's visit anthony came home at first he pronounced against her inexorably dismissing her as nonsense and as a fine lady terms to him interchangeable then his condemnation began to falter then ceased then acquittal and at last commendation succeeded for miss corbett asked his advice about the dogs and how to get that wonderful gloss on their coats that his had and she asked his help too once or twice and praised his skill and once asked to feel his muscle and then she was so gallant in ways that appealed to him she was not in the least afraid of eliza she kissed that ferocious head in spite of the glare of that steady yellow eye and yet all with an air of trusting to anthony's protection she tore her silk stocking across the instep in a bramble and scratched her foot without even drawing attention to it as she followed him along one of his short cuts through the copse and it was only by chance that he saw it and then this gallant girl so simple and ignorant as she seemed out of doors was like a splendid queen indoors and was able to hold her own or rather to soar above all these elders who were so apt to look over anthony's head on grave occasions and they all had to listen while she talked in fact the first time he saw her at the hall in all her splendour he could hardly realise it was the same girl till she laughed up at him and nodded and said how much she had enjoyed the afternoon's stroll and how much she would have to tell when she got back to court in short so incessant were her poses and so skilful her manner and tone and so foolish this poor boy that in a very few days after he had pronounced her to be nonsense anthony was at her feet hopelessly fascinated by the combination of the glitter and friendliness of this fine court lady to do her justice she would have behaved exactly the same to a statue or even to nothing at all as a peacock dances and postures and vibrates his plumes to a kitten and had no more deliberate intention of giving pain to anybody than a nightshade has of poisoning a silly sheep the sublime conceit of a boy of fifteen made him of course think that she had detected in him a nobility that others overlooked and so anthony began a gorgeous course of day-dreaming in which he moved as a kind of king worshipped and reverenced by this splendid creature who after a disillusionment from the empty vanities of a court life and a queen's favour found at last the lord of her heart in a simple manly young countryman these dreams however he had the grace and modesty to keep holy to himself mary came down one day and found the two in the garden together come my child she said and you too master anthony if you can spare time to escort us and take me to the church i want to see it the church said isabel that is locked we must go to the rectory locked exclaimed mary and is that part of the blessed reformation well come at any rate they all went across to the village and down the green towards the rectory whose garden adjoined the churchyard on the south side of the church anthony walked with something of an air in front of the two ladies isabel told her as they went about the rector and his views mary nodded and smiled and seemed to understand we'll tap at the window said anthony it's the quickest way they came up towards the study window that looked on to the drive when anthony who was in front suddenly recoiled and then laughed they're at it again he said the next moment mary was looking through the window too the rector was sitting in his chair opposite a small dark clean-shaven man 
but his face was set with a look of distressed determination and his lower lip was sucked in his eyes were fixed firmly on a tall slender woman whose back was turned to the window and who seemed to be declaiming with outstretched hand the rector suddenly saw the faces at the window we seem to be interrupting said mary coolly as she turned away End of chapter four chapter five of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain a writer from london we will walk on master anthony said mistress corbett will you bring the keys when the rector and his lady have done she spoke with a vehement bitterness that made isabel look at her in amazement as the two walked on by the private path to the churchyard gate mary's face was set in a kind of fury and she went forward with her chin thrust disdainfully out biting her lip isabel said nothing as they reached the gate they heard steps behind them and turning saw the minister and anthony hastening together mr dent was in his cassock and gown and square cap and carried the keys his little scholarly face with a sharp curved nose like a beak and dark eyes set rather too close together was not unlike a bird's and a way he had of sudden sharp movements of his head increased the likeness mary looked at him with scarcely veiled contempt he glanced at her sharply and uneasily mistress mary corbett he said interrogatively mary bowed to him may we see the church sir uh, your church i should say perhaps that is if we are not disturbing you mr dent made a polite inclination and opened the gate for them to go through then mary changed her tactics and a genial good-humoured look came over her face but isabel who glanced at her now and again as they went round to the porch at the west end still felt uneasy as the rector was unlocking the porch door mary surveyed him with a pleased smile why you look quite like a priest she said do your bishops or whatever you call them allow that dress i thought you had done away with it all mr dent looked at her but seeing nothing but geniality and interest in her face explained elaborately in the porch that he was a catholic priest practically though the word minister was more commonly used and that it was the old church still only cleansed from superstitions mary shook her head at him cheerfully smiling like a happy puzzled child it is all too difficult for me she said it cannot be the same church or why should we poor catholics be so much abused and persecuted besides what of the pope mr dent explained that the pope was one of the superstitions in question ah i see you are too sharp for me said mary beaming at him then they entered the church and mary began immediately on a running comment how sad that little niche looks she said i suppose our lady is in pieces somewhere on a dunghill surely father i, I beg your pardon mr dent it cannot be the same religion if you have knocked our lady to pieces but then i suppose you would say that she was the superstition too and where is the old altar is that broken too and is that a superstition too what a number there must have been and the holy water too i see but that looks a very nice table up there you have instead ah and i see you read the new prayers from a new desk outside the screen and not from the priest's stall was that a superstition too and the mass vestments has your wife had any of them made up to be useful the stoles are no good i fear but you could make charming stomachers out of the chasubles they were walking slowly up the centre aisle now and mr dent had to explain that the vestments had been burnt on the green ah oh, yes i see she said and do you wear a surplice or do you not like them i see the chancel roof is all broken were there angels there once i suppose so but how strange to break them all unless they are superstitions too 
I thought Protestants believed in them, but I see I was wrong. What do you believe in, Mr. Dent? she asked, turning large, bright, perplexed eyes upon him for a moment, but she gave him no time to answer. Ah! she cried suddenly, and her voice rang with pain. There is the altar stone. And she went down on her knees at the chancel entrance, bending down, it seemed, in an agony of devout sorrow and shame, and kissed, with a gentle lingering reverence, the great slab with its five crosses, set in the ground, at the destruction of the altar, to show there was no sanctity attached to it. She knelt there a moment or two, her lips moving, and her black eyes cast up at the great east window, cracked and flawed with stones and poles the puritan boy and girl looked at her with astonishment they had not seen this side of her before when she rose from her knees her eyes seemed bright with tears and her voice was tender forgive me mr dent she said with a kind of pathetic dignity putting out a slender beringed hand to him but but you know for I think perhaps you have some sympathy for us poor Catholics. You know what all this means to me. She went up into the chancel and looked about her in silence. This was the Piscina, Mistress Corbett, said the rector. She nodded her head regretfully, as at some relic of a dead friend, but said nothing. They came out again presently and turned through the old iron gates into what had been the Maxwell Chapel the centre was occupied by an altar tomb with sir nicholas parents lying in black stone upon it old sir james held his right gauntlet in his left hand and with his right hand he held the right hand of his wife which was crossed over to meet it and the two steady faces gazed upon the disfigured roof the altar where a weekly requiem had been said for them was gone and the footpace and piscina alone showed where it had stood this was a chantry of course said mistress corbett the rector confessed that it had been so ah oh, she said mournfully the altar is cast out and the priest gone but uh, but forgive me sir the money is here still but then she added i suppose the money is not a superstition when they reached the west entrance again, she turned and looked up the aisle again. And the rood, she said, even Christ crucified is gone. Then in God's name, what is left? And her eyes turned fiercely for a moment on the rector. At least courtesy and Christian kindness is left, madam, he said sternly. She dropped her eyes and went out and Isabel and Anthony followed, startled and ashamed. But Mary had recovered herself as she came on to the head of the stone stairs, beside which the stump of the churchyard cross stood. Standing there was the same tall, slender woman whose back they had seen through the window, and who now stood eyeing Mary with half-dropped lids. Her face was very white, with hard lines from nose to mouth, and thin, tightly compressed lips. Mary swept her with one look, and then passed on and down the steps, followed by Isabel and Anthony, as the rector came out, locking the church door again behind them. As they went up the green, a shrill, thin voice began to scold from over the churchyard wall, and they heard the lower, determined voice of the minister answering. "'They're at it again,' said Anthony once more. "'And what do you mean by that, Master Anthony?' said mistress corbett who seemed herself again now she is just a scold said the lad the village folk hate her you seem not to love her said mary smiling oh mistress corbett do you know what she said and then he broke off crimson-faced she is no friend to catholics i suppose said mary seeming to notice nothing she is always making mischief he went on eagerly the rector would be well enough but for her he is a good fellow really there there said mary and you think me a scold too i dare say well you know i cannot bear to see these old churches well perhaps i was and then she broke off again and was silent 
the brother and sister presently turned back to the dower house and mary went on and through the hall straight into the italian garden where mistress margaret was sitting alone at her embroidery my sister has been called away by the housekeeper she explained but she will be back presently mary sat down and took up the little tawny book that lay by lady maxwell's chair and began to turn it over idly while she talked the old lady by her seemed to invite confidences i've been to see the church said mary the rector showed it to me what a beautiful place it must have been ah said mistress margaret i only came to live here a few years ago so i have never known or loved it like my sister or her husband they can hardly bear to enter it now you know that sir nicholas father and grandfather are buried in the maxwell chapel and it was his father who gave the furniture of the sanctuary and the images of our lady and saint christopher that they burned on the green it is terrible said mary a little absently as she turned the pages of the book mistress margaret looked up ah you have one of my books there she said it is a little collection i made miss corbett turned to the beginning but only found a seal with an inscription but this belonged to a nunnery she said yes said mistress margaret tranquilly and i am a nun mary looked at her in astonishment uh, but um, but, but she began yes mistress corbett we were dispersed in thirty eight some entered the other nunneries and some went to france but at last under circumstances that i need not trouble you with i came here under spiritual direction and have observed my obligations ever since and have you always said your offices mary asked astonished yes my dear by the mercy of god i have never failed yet i tell you this of course because you are one of us and because you have a faithful heart mistress margaret lifted her great eyes and looked at mary tenderly and penetratingly and this is one of your books she asked yes my dear i was allowed at least to take it away with me my sister here is very fond of it mary opened it again and began to turn the pages is it all in your handwriting mistress torridon yes my child i continued writing in it ever since i first entered religion in fifteen thirty four so you see the handwriting changes a little and she smiled to herself oh but this is charming cried mary intent on the book read it my dear aloud mary read let me not rest o lord nor have quiet but fill my soul with spiritual travail to sing and say o oh, mercy jesus sweet thou my protection art in the battle set thou aside all other apparel let me in thee feel all my affiance treasure of treasures thou dost most avail grant ere i die shrift pardon repentance her voice trembled a little and ceased that is from some verses of dan john lydgate i think said mistress margaret here is another said mary in a moment or two jesu at thy will i pray that i may be all my heart fulfill with perfect love to thee that i have done ill jesu forgive thou me and suffer me never to spill jesu for thy pity the nuns of hampel gave me that said mistress margaret it is by richard rolla the hermit tell me a little said mary corbett suddenly laying down the book about the nunnery oh my dear that is too much to ask but how happy we were all was so still it used to seem sometimes as if earth were just a dream and that we walked in paradise sometimes in the greater silence when we had spoken no word nor heard one except in god's praise it used to seem that if we could but be silent a little longer and a little more deeply in our hearts as well we should hear them talking in heaven and the harps and the saviour's soft footsteps but it was not always like that you mean said mary softly that that and she stopped oh 
it was hard sometimes but not often god is so good but he used to allow such trouble and darkness and noise to be in our hearts sometimes at least in mine but then of course i was always very wicked but sitting in the nymph hay sometimes on a day like this as we were allowed to do with just tall thin trees like poplars and cypresses round us and the stream running through the long grass and the birds and the soft sky and the little breeze and then peace in our hearts and the love of the saviour round us it seemed it seemed as if god had nothing more to give or i should say as if our hearts had no more space mary was strangely subdued and quiet her little restless movements were still for once and her quick vivacious face was tranquil and a little awed oh mistress margaret i love to hear you talk like that tell me more well my dear we thought too much about ourselves i think and too little about god and his poor children who were not so happy as we were so then the troubles began and they got nearer and nearer and at last the visitor came he he was my brother my dear which made it harder but he made a good end i will tell you his story another time he took away our great crucifix and our jewelled cope that old mr wickham used to wear on the great festivals and left us he turned me out too and another who asked to go but i went back for a while and then my dear although we offered everything our cows and our orchard and our hens and all we had you know how it ended and one morning in may old mr wickham said mass for us quite early before the sun was risen for the last time and and he cried my dear at the elevation and and we were all crying too i think and we all received communion together for the last time and and then we all went away leaving just old dame agnes to keep the house until the commissioner came and oh my dear i i don't think the house ever looked so dear as it did that morning just as the sun rose over the roofs and we were passing out through the meadow door where we had sat so often to where the horses were waiting to take us away miss corbett's own eyes were full of tears as the old lady finished and she put out her white slender hand which mistress torridon took and stroked for a moment well she said i haven't talked like this for a long while but i knew you would understand my dear i have watched you while you have been here this time mary corbett smiled a little uneasily and you have found me out she answered smiling no no but i think our saviour has found you out or at least he is drawing very near a slight discomfort made itself felt in mary's heart this nun then was like all the rest always trying to turn the whole world into monks and nuns by hints and pretended intuitions into the unseen and you think i should be a nun too she asked with just a shade of coolness in her tone i should suppose not said mistress margaret tranquilly you do not seem to have a vocation for that but i should think that our lord means you to serve him where you are who knows what you may not accomplish this was a little disconcerting to mary corbett it was not at all what she had expected she did not know what to say and took up the leather book again and began to turn over the pages mistress margaret went on serenely with her embroidery which she had neglected during the last sentence or two and there was silence tell me a little more about the nunnery said mary in a minute or two leaning back in her chair with the book on her knees well my dear i scarcely know what to say it is all far off now like a childhood we talked very little and not at all until recreation except by signs and we used to spend a good deal of our time in embroidery that is where i learnt this and she held out her work to mary for a moment it was an exquisite piece of needlework representing a stag 
running open-mouthed through thickets of green twining branches that wrapped themselves about his horns and feet mary had never seen anything quite like it before what does it mean she asked looking at it curiously quemad modum cervus began mistress margaret as the heart brayeth after the water brooks and she took the embroidery and began to go on with it it is the soul you see desiring and fleeing to god while the things of the world hold her back well you see it is difficult to talk about it for it is the inner life that is the real history of a convent the outer things are all plain and simple like all else well said mary is it really true that you were happy the old lady stopped working a moment and looked up at her my dear there's no happiness in the world like it she said simply i dream sometimes that we are all back there together and i wake crying for joy the other night i dreamed that we were all in the chapel again and that it was a spring morning with the dawn beginning to show the painted windows and that all the tapers were burning and that mass was beginning not one stall was empty not even old dame gertrude who died when i was a novice was lacking and mr wickham made us a sermon after the creed and showed us the crucifix back in its place again and told us that we were all good children and that our lord had only sent us away to see if we would be patient and that he was now pleased with us and had let us come home again and that we should never have to go away again not even when we died and then i understood that we were in heaven and that it was all over and i burst into tears in my stall for happiness and then i awoke and found myself in bed but my cheeks were really wet well well perhaps by the mercy of god it may all come true some day she spoke so simply that mary corbett was amazed she had always fancied that the religious life was a bitter struggle worth indeed living for those who could bear it for the sake of the eternal reward but it had scarcely even occurred to her that it was so full of joy in itself and she looked up under her brows at the old lady whose needle had stopped for a moment a moment after and lady maxwell appeared coming down the steps into the garden and at her side anthony who was dressed ready for riding old mistress margaret had as she said been watching mary corbett those last few weeks and had determined to speak to her plainly her instinct had told her that beneath this flippancy and glitter there was something that would respond and she was anxious to leave nothing undone by which mary might be awakened to the inner world that was in such danger of extinction in her soul it cost the old lady a great effort to break through her ordinary reserve but she judged that mary could only be reached on her human side and that there were not many of her friends whose human sympathy would draw her in the right direction it is strange sometimes to find that some silent old lady has a power for sounding human character which far shrewder persons lack quiet old nun so ignorant one would have said of the world and of the motives from which ordinary people act had managed somehow to touch springs in this girl's heart that had never been reached before and now as miss corbett and lady maxwell talked and anthony lolled embarrassed beside them attempting now and then to join in the conversation mistress margaret as she sat a little apart and worked away at the panting stag dreamed away smiling quietly to herself of all the old scenes that her own conversation had called up into clearer consciousness of the pleasant little meadow of the sussex priory with the old apple trees and the straight box-lined path called the nun's walk from time immemorial all lighted with the pleasant afternoon glow as it streamed from the west throwing the slender poplar shadows across the grass and of the quiet chatter of the brook as it overflowed from the fish ponds at the end of the field and ran through the meadows beyond the hedge the cooing of the pigeons as they sunned themselves round the dial in the centre of this italian garden and on the roof of the hall 
helped on her reminiscences, for there had been a dovecot at the priory. Where were all her sisters now? Those who had sat with her in the same sombre habits in the garth, with the same sunshine in their hearts. Some she knew, and thanked God for it, were safe in glory. Others were old like her, but still safe in holy religion in France, where as yet there was peace and sanctuary for the servants of the Most High. One or two, and for these she lifted up her heart in petition as she sat. One or two had gone back to the world, relinquished everything, and died to grace. Then the old faces one by one passed before her, old Dame Agnes, with her mumbling lips and her rosy cheeks like wrinkled apples, looking so fresh and wholesome in the white linen about her face. And then the others one by one, that white-faced, large-eyed sister, who had shown such passionate devotion at first, that they all thought that God was going to raise up a saint amongst them. Ah, God help her! She had sunk back at the dissolution from those heights of sanctity towards whose summits she had set her face, down into the muddy torrent of the world that went roaring down to the abyss, and who was responsible. There was Dame Avis, the sacristan, with her business-like movements going about the garden gathering flowers for the altar, with her queer pursed lips as she arranged them in her hands, with her head a little on one side. How annoying she used to be sometimes! But how good and tender at heart! God rest her soul! And there was Mr. Wickham, the old priest who had been their chaplain for so many years, and who lived in the village parsonage, waited upon by Tom Down, that served at the altar too, he who had got the horses ready when the nuns had to go at last on that far-off May morning, and had stood there holding the bridles and trying to hide his wet face behind the horse. Where was Tom now? And Mr. Wickham, too. He had gone to France with some of the nuns, but he had never settled down there. He couldn't bear the French ways. And besides, he had left his heart behind him, buried in the little Sussex priory among the meadows. And so the old lady sat, musing, while the light and shadow of reminiscence moved across her face, and her lips quivered, or her eyes wrinkled up with humor, at the thought of all those old folks, with their faces and their movements, and their ways of doing and speaking. Ah, well, please God, some day her dream would really come true, and they shall all be gathered again from France and England with their broken hearts mended and their tears wiped away, and Mr. Wickham himself shall minister to them and make them sermons, and Tom Down, too, shall be there to minister to him, all in one of the many mansions of which the Saviour spoke. And so she heard nothing of the talk of the others, though her sister looked at her tenderly once or twice, and Mary Corbett chattered and twitched her buckles in the sun, and Anthony sat embarrassed in the midst of paradise, and she knew nothing of where she was nor of what was happening round her, until Mary Corbett said that it was time for the horses to be round, and that she must go and get ready and not keep Mr. James and Mr. Anthony waiting. Then, as she and Anthony went towards the house, the old lady looked up from the braying stag and found herself alone with her sister. Mistress Margaret waited until the other two disappeared up the steps, and then spoke. "'I have told her all, sister,' she said. "'She can be trusted.' Lady Maxwell nodded gently. "'She has a good heart,' went on the other, "'and our Lord, no doubt, will find some work for her to do at court.' There was silence again, broken by the gentle little sound of the silk being drawn through the stuff. "'You know best, Margaret.' said Lady Maxwell. Even as she spoke, there was the sound of a door thrown violently open, and old Sir Nicholas appeared on the top of the steps, hatless and plainly in a state of great agitation. Beside him stood a courier, covered with the dust of the white roads, and his face crimson with hard riding. Sir Nicholas stood there as if dazed, and Lady Maxwell sprang up quickly to go to him, but a moment after there appeared behind him a little group, his son James, Miss Corbett, and a servant or two, while Anthony hung back, 
and Mr. James came up quickly and took his father by the arm, and together the little company came down the steps into the still and sunny garden. "'What is it?' cried Lady Maxwell, trying to keep her voice under control, while Mistress Margaret laid her work quietly down and stood up, too. "'Tell my lady,' said Sir Nicholas to the courier, who stood a little apart. "'If you please, my lady,' he said, as if repeating a lesson, "'a bull of the Holy Father has been found, nailed to the door of the Bishop of London's palace, deposing Elizabeth, and releasing all her subjects from their allegiance.' Lady Maxwell went to her husband and took him by the arm gently. "'What does it mean, sweetheart?' she asked. "'It means that Catholics must choose between their sovereign and their God.' "'God have mercy,' said a servant behind. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Stewart. Sir Nicholas' exclamatory sentence was no exaggeration. That terrible choice of which he spoke, with his old eyes shining with the desire to make it, did not indeed come so immediately as he anticipated, but it came none the less. From every point of view, the bull was unfortunate though it may have been a necessity for it marked the declaration of war between england and the catholic church a gentle appeal had been tried before elizabeth who it must be remembered had been crowned during mass with catholic ceremonial and had received the blessed sacrament had been entreated by the pope as his dear daughter in christ to return to the fold and now there seemed to him no possibility left but this ultimatum it is indeed difficult to see what else from his point of view he could have done to continue to pretend that elizabeth was his dear daughter would have discredited his fatherly authority in the eyes of the whole christian world he had patiently made an advance towards his wayward child but she had repudiated and scorned him nothing was left but to recognize and treat her as an enemy of the faith a usurper of spiritual prerogatives and an apostate spoiler of churches to do this might certainly bring trouble upon others of his less distinguished but more obedient children who were in her power but to pretend that the suffering thus brought down upon Catholics was unnecessary, and that the Pope alone was responsible for their persecution, is to be blind to the fact that Elizabeth had already openly defied and repudiated his authority, and had begun to do her utmost to coax and compel his children to be disobedient to their father. The shock of the bull to Elizabeth was considerable she had not expected this extreme measure and it was commonly reported too that france and spain were likely now to unite on a religious basis against england and that at least one of these powers had sanctioned the issue of the bull this of course helped greatly to complicate further the already complicated political position steps were taken immediately to strengthen england's position against scotland with whom it was now more than ever to be feared that france would cooperate and the channel fleet was reinforced under lord clifton and placed with respect to france in what was almost a state of war while it was already in an informal state of war with spain there was fierce confusion in the privy council elizabeth who at once began to vacillate under the combined threats of la Motha, the french ambassador and the arguments of the friend of catholics lord arundel was counter-threatened with ruin by lord keeper bacon unless she would throw in her lot finally with the protestants and continue her hostility and resistance to the catholic scotch party but in spite of bacon elizabeth's heart failed her and if it had not been for the rashness of mary stuart's friends 
Lord Southampton, and the Bishop of Ross, the Queen might have been induced to substitute conciliation for severity towards Mary and the Catholic party generally. Southampton was arrested, and again there followed the further encouragement of the Protestant camp by the rising fortunes of the Huguenots, and the temporary reverses to French Catholicism. So the pendulum swung this way and that. Elizabeth's policy changed almost from day to day. She was tormented with temporal fears of a continental crusade against her, and by the spiritual terrors of the Pope's bull, and her unfathomable fickleness was the despair of her servants. Meanwhile in the religious world a furious paper war broke out, and volleys from both sides followed the solemn roar and crash of Regnans in Excelsis. But while the war of words went on, and the theological assaults and charges were given and received, repulsed or avoided, something practical must, it was felt, be done immediately, and search was made high and low for other copies of the bull. The lawyers in the previous year had fallen under suspicion of religious unsoundness. Judges could not be trusted to convict Catholics accused of their religion and counsel was unwilling to prosecute them. Therefore, the first inquisition was made in the inns of court, and almost immediately a copy of the bull was found in the room of a student in Lincoln's Inn, who upon the rack in the tower confessed that he had received it from one John Felton, a Catholic gentleman who lived upon his property in Southwark. Upon Felton's arrest, for he had not attempted to escape, he confessed immediately, without pressure, that he had affixed the bull to the Bishop of London's gate. But although he was racked repeatedly, he would not incriminate a single person besides himself, but at his trial would only assert with a joyous confidence that he was not alone, and that twenty-five peers, six hundred gentlemen, and thirty thousand commoners were ready to die in the holy father's quarrel he behaved with astonishing gallantry throughout and after his condemnation had been pronounced upon the fourth of august at the guild hall on the charge of high treason he sent a diamond ring from his own finger at the value of four hundred pounds to the queen to show that he bore her no personal ill-will he had been always a steadfast catholic his wife had been maid of honour to mary and a friend of elizabeth's on august the eighth he suffered the abominable punishment prescribed he was drawn on a hurdle to the gate of the bishop's palace in st paul's churchyard where he had affixed the bull hanged upon a new gallows, cut down before he was unconscious, disemboweled and quartered. His name has since been placed on the roll of the blessed by the apostolic see, in whose quarrel he so cheerfully laid down his life. News of these and such events continued, of course, to be eagerly sought after by the papists all over the kingdom and the Maxwells, down at Great Keynes, kept in as close touch with the heart of affairs as almost any private persons in the kingdom out of town. Sir Nicholas was one of those fiery natures to whom opposition or pressure is as oil to flame. He began at once to organize his forces and prepare for the struggle that was bound to come. He established first a kind of private post to london and to other catholic houses round for purposes however of defence rather than offence so that if any steps were threatened he and his friends might be aware of the danger in time there was great sorrow at the news of john felton's death and mass was said for his soul almost immediately in the little oratory at maxwell court by one of the concealed priests who went chiefly between hampshire and sussex ministering to the catholics of those districts mistress margaret spent longer than ever at her prayers 
Lady Maxwell had all she could do to keep her husband from some furious act of fanatical retaliation for John Felton's death, some useless provocation of the authorities. The children at the dower house began to come to the hall less often, not because they were less welcomed, but because there was a constraint in the air. All seemed preoccupied. Conversations ceased abruptly on their entrance and fits of abstraction would fall from time to time upon their kindly hosts in the meanwhile too the preparations for james maxwell's departure which had already begun to show themselves were now pushed forward rapidly and one morning in the late summer when isabel came up to the hall she found that lady maxwell was confined to her room and could not be seen that day she caught a glimpse of Sir Nicholas's face as he quickly crossed the entrance hall that made her draw back from daring to intrude on such grief, and on inquiry found that Mr. James had ridden away that morning, and that the servants did not know when to expect him back, nor what was his destination. In other ways also at this time did Sir Nicholas actively help on his party great keynes was in a convenient position and circumstances for agents who came across from the continent it was sufficiently near london yet not so near to the high road or to london itself as to make disturbance probable and its very quietness under the spiritual care of a moderate minister like mr dent and its serenity owing to the secret sympathy of many of the villagers and neighbours as well as from the personal friendship between Sir Nicholas and the master of the dower house, an undoubted Protestant. All these circumstances combined to make Maxwell House a favorable halting place for priests and agents from the continent, strangers on horseback or in carriages, and sometimes even on foot, would arrive there after nightfall and leave in a day or two for London its nearness to london enabled them to enter the city at any hour they thought best after ten or eleven in the forenoon they came on very various businesses some priests even stayed there and made the hall a centre for their spiritual ministrations for miles round others came with dispatches from abroad some of which were even addressed to great personages at court and at the embassies where much was being done by the ambassadors at this time to aid their comrades in the faith and to other leading catholics and others again came with pamphlets printed abroad for distribution in england some of them indeed seditious but many of them purely controversial and hortatory with other devotional articles and books such as it was difficult to obtain in england and might not be exposed for public sale in booksellers' shops, on you stays, beads, hallowed incense, and crosses, were being sent in large numbers from abroad, and were eagerly sought after by the papists in all directions. It was remarkable that, while threatening clouds appeared to be gathering on all sides over the Catholic cause, yet the deepening peril was accompanied by a great outburst of religious zeal it was reported to the archbishop that massing was greatly on the increase in kent and was attributed singularly enough to the northern rebellion which had ended in disaster for the papists but the very fact that such a movement could take place at all probably heartened many secret sympathizers who had hitherto considered themselves almost alone in a heretic population sir nicholas came in one day to dinner in a state of great fury one of his couriers had just arrived with news from london and the old man came in fuming and resentful what hypocrisy he cried out to lady maxwell and mistress margaret who were seated at table not content with persecuting catholics they will not even allow us to say we are persecuted for the faith here is the lord keeper declaring in the star chamber that no man is to be persecuted for his private faith but only for his public acts 
and that the queen's grace desires nothing so little as to meddle with any man's conscience then i suppose they would say that hearing mass was a public act and therefore unlawful but then how if a man's private faith bids him to hear mass is not that meddling with his private conscience to forbid him to go to mass what folly is this and yet my lord keeper and her grace are no fools then they are worse than fools lady maxwell tried to quiet the old man for the servants were not out of the room and it was terribly rash to speak like that before them but he would not be still nor sit down but raged up and down before the hearth growling and breaking out now and again what especially he could not get off his mind was that this was the old religion that was prescribed that england for generations had held the faith and that then the faith and all that it involved had been declared unlawful was to him iniquity unfathomable he could well understand some new upstart sect being persecuted but not the old religion he kept on returning to this have they so far forgotten the old faith as to think it can be held in a man's private conscience without appearing in his life like their miserable damnable new-fangled justification by faith without works or that a man can believe in the blessed sacrament of the altar and yet not desire to receive it or in penance and yet not be absolved or in peter and yet not say so nor be reconciled you may believe say they of their clemency what you like be justified by that that is enough bah however mere declaiming against the government was barren work and sir nicholas soon saw that and instead threw himself with more vigour than ever into entertaining and forwarding the foreign emissaries mary corbett had returned to london by the middle of july and hubert was not yet returned so sir nicholas and the two ladies had the hall to themselves now it must be confessed that the old man had neither the nature nor the training for the role of a conspirator even of the mildest description he was so exceedingly impulsive unsuspicious and passionate that it would have been the height of folly to entrust him with any weighty secret if it was possible to dispense with him but the catholics over the water needed stationary agents so grievously and sir nicholas name commanded such respect and his house such conveniences that they overlooked the risk involved in making him their confidant again and again besides it need not be said that his honour and fidelity was beyond reproach and those qualities after all balance favourably against a good deal of shrewdness and discretion he of course was serenely unable to distinguish between sedition and religion and entertained political meddlers and ordinary priests with an equal enthusiasm it was pathetic to lady maxwell to see her simple old husband shuffling away his papers and puzzling over ciphers and perpetually leaving the key of them lying about and betraying again and again when he least intended it by his mysterious becks and nods and glances and oracular sayings that some scheme was afoot she could have helped him considerably if he had allowed her but he had an idea that the capacities of ladies in general went no further than their harps their embroidery and their devotions and besides he was chivalrously unwilling that his wife should be in any way privy to business that involved such risks as this one sunny morning in august he came into her room early just as she was finishing her prayers and announced the arrival of an emissary from abroad sweetheart he said will you prepare the east chamber 
for a young man whom we will call mr stuart if you please who will arrive to-night he hopes to be with us until after dusk to-morrow when he will leave and i shall be obliged if you will no no my dear i will order the horses myself the old man then bustled off to the stable-yard and ordered a saddle-horse to be taken at once to cuckfield accompanied by a groom on another horse these were to arrive at the inn and await orders from a stranger whom you will call mr stuart if you please mr stuart was to change horses there and ride on to maxwell hall and sir nicholas further ordered the same two horses and the same groom to be ready the following evening at about nine o'clock and to be at mr stuart's orders again as before this behaviour of sir nicholas was of course most culpably indiscreet a child could not but have suspected something and the grooms who were of course catholics winked merrily at one another when the conspirator's back was turned and he had hastened in a transport of zeal and preoccupation back again to the house to interrupt his wife in her preparations for the guest that evening mr stuart arrived according to arrangements he was a slim red-haired man not above thirty years of age the kind of man his enemies would call foxy with a very courteous and deliberate manner and he spoke with a slight scotch accent he had the air of doing everything on purpose he let his riding-whip fall as he greeted lady maxwell in the entrance hall but picked it up with such a dignified grace that you would have sworn he had let it fall for some wise reason of his own he had a couple of saddle-bags with him which he did not let out of his sight for a moment even keeping his eye upon them as he met the ladies and saluted them they were carried up to the east chamber directly their owner following where supper had been prepared there was no real reason since he arrived with such publicity why he should not have supped downstairs but sir nicholas had been peremptory it was by his directions also that the arrival had been accomplished in the manner it had after he had supped sir nicholas receiving the dishes from the servant's hands at the door of the room with the same air of secrecy and dispatch his host suggested that he should come to lady maxwell's drawing-room as the ladies were anxious to see him mr stuart asked leave to bring a little valise with him that had travelled in one of the bags and then followed his host who preceded him with a shaded light along the gallery when he entered he bowed again profoundly with a slightly french air to the ladies and to the image over the fire and then seated himself and asked leave to open his valise he did so with their permission and displayed to them the numerous devotional articles and books that it contained the ladies and sir nicholas were delighted and set aside at once some new books of devotion and then they fell to talk the netherlands from which mr stuart had arrived two days before on the east coast were full at this time of catholic refugees under the duke of alva's protection here they had been living some of them even from elizabeth's accession and sir nicholas and his ladies had many inquiries to make about their acquaintances many of which mr stuart was able to satisfy for from his conversation he was plainly one in the confidence of catholics both at home and abroad and so the evening passed away quietly it was thought better by sir nicholas that mr stuart should not be present at the evening devotions that he always conducted for the household in the dining-room unless indeed a priest were present to take his place so mr stuart was again conducted with the same secrecy to the east chamber and sir nicholas promised at his request to look in on him again after prayers when prayers were over sir nicholas went up to his guest's room and found him awaiting him in a state of evident excitement very unlike the quiet vivacity and good humour he had shown when with the ladies sir nicholas he said standing up as his host came in i have not told you all my news and when they were both seated he proceeded you spoke a few minutes ago sir nicholas of dr story he has been caught the old man exclaimed with dismay mr stuart went on when i left antwerp sir nicholas dr story was in the town 
I saw him myself in the street by the cathedral, only a few hours before I embarked. He is very old, you know, and lame, worn out with good works, and he was hobbling down the street on the arm of a young man. When I arrived at Yarmouth, I went out into the streets about a little business I had with a bookseller before taking horse. I heard a great commotion down near the docks at the entrance of Bridge Street and hastened down there, and there I saw pursuivants and seamen and officers all gathered about a carriage and keeping back the crowd that was pressing and crying out to know who the man was and presently the carriage drove by me scattering the crowd and i could see within and there sat old dr story very white and ill-looking but steady and cheerful whom i had seen the very day before in antwerp now this is very grievous for dr story and i pray god to deliver him but surely the duke and the king of spain must move now they cannot leave him in cecil's hands and then sir nicholas we must all be ready for who knows what may happen sir nicholas was greatly moved there was one of the perplexities which so much harassed all the papists at this time it seemed certain that mr stuart's prediction must be fulfilled dr story was a naturalized subject of king philip and in the employment of alva and he had been carried off forcibly by the english government it afterwards came out how it had been done he had been lured away from antwerp and enticed on board a traitor at bergen op zoom by cecil's agents with the help of a traitor named parker on pretext of finding heretical books there arriving from england and as soon as he had set foot on deck he was hurried below and carried straight off to yarmouth here then was sir nicholas perplexity to welcome spain when she intervened and to work actively for her was treason against his country to act against spain was to delay the re-establishment of the religion something that appeared to him very like treason against his faith was the dreadful choice between his sovereign and his god he wondered as he paced up and down and questioned mr stuart even now imminent the whole affair too was so formidable and so mysterious that the hearts of these catholics and of others in england when they heard the tale began to fail them had the government then so long an arm and so keen an eye and if it was able to hail a man from the shadow of the cathedral at antwerp and the protection of the duke of alva into the hands of pursuivants at yarmouth within the space of a few hours who then was safe and so the two sat late that night in the east chamber and laid schemes and discussed movements and probabilities and the like until the dawn began to glimmer through the cracks of the shutters and the birds to chirp in the eaves and sir nicholas at last carried to bed with him an anxious and a heavy heart mr stuart however did not seem so greatly disturbed possibly because on the one side he had not others dearer to him than his own life involved in these complex issues and partly because he at any rate has not the weight of suspense and indecision that so drew his host two ways at once for mr stuart was whole-heartedly committed already and knew well how he would act should the choice present itself between elizabeth and philip the following morning sir nicholas still would not allow his guest to come downstairs and insisted that all his meals should be served in the east chamber while he himself as before received the food at the door and set it before mr stuart mr stuart was greatly impressed and touched by the kindness of the old man although not by his capacity for conspiracy he had intended indeed to tell his host far more than he had done 
of the movements of political and religious events for he could not but believe before his arrival that a catholic so prominent and influential as sir nicholas was becoming by reputation among the refugees abroad was a proper person to be entrusted even with the highest secrets but after a very little conversation with him the night before he had seen how ingenuous the old man was with his laughable attempts at secrecy and his lamentable lack of discretion and so he had contented himself with general information and gossip and had really told sir nicholas very little indeed of any importance after dinner sir nicholas again conducted his guest to the drawing-room where the ladies were ready to receive him he had obtained mr stewart's permission the night before to tell his wife and sister-in-law the news about dr story and the four sat for several hours together discussing the situation mr stuart was able to tell them too in greater detail the story of lord sussex's punitive raid into scotland in the preceding april they had heard of course the main outline of the story with the kind of embroideries attached that were usual in those days of inaccurate reporting but their guest was a scotchman himself and had had the stories first hand in some cases from those rendered homeless by the raid who had fled to the netherlands where he had met them briefly the raid was undertaken on the pretended plea of an invitation from the king's men or adherence of the infant james but in reality to chastise scotland and reduce it to servility sussex and lord hunsdon in the east lord scrope on the west had harried burnt and destroyed in the whole countryside about the borders especially had tiviotdale suffered altogether it was calculated that sussex had burned three hundred villages and blown up fifty castles and forty more strong houses some of these latter however being little more than border peels mr stuart's accounts were the more moving in that he spoke in a quiet delicate tone and used little picturesque phrases in his speech twelve years ago said mr stuart i was at brank's home myself it was a pleasant house well furnished and appointed fortified too as all need to be in that country with sheaves of pikes in all the lower rooms and sir walter scott gave me a warm welcome for i was there on a business that pleased him he showed me the gardens and orchards all green and sweet like these of yours lady maxwell and it seemed to me a home where a man might be content to spend all his days well my lord sussex has been a visitor there now and what he has left of the house would not shelter a cow nor what is left of the pleasant gardens sustain her at least so one of the scots told me whom i met in the netherlands in june he talked too of the extraordinary scenes of romance and chivalry in which mary queen of scots moved during her captivity under lord scrope's care at bolton castle in the previous year he had met in his travels in france one of her undistinguished adherents who had managed to get a position in the castle during her detention there the country was alive with her worshippers said mr stuart they swarmed like bees round a hive in the night voices would be heard crying out to her grace out of the darkness round the castle and when the guards rode out they would find no man but maybe hear just a laugh or two her men would lie out at night and watch her window for she would never go to rest till late and pray towards it as if it were a light before the blessed sacrament when she rode out a hunting with her guards of course about her and my lord scrope or sir francis knollys never far away a beggar maybe would be sitting out on the road and ask an alms and cry out 
god save your grace but he would be a beggar who was accustomed to wear silks next his skin except when he went a begging many young gentlemen there were yes and old ones too who would thank god for a blow or a curse from some foul english trooper for his meat if only he might have a look from the queen's eyes for his grace before meat oh they would plot too and scheme and lie awake half the night spinning their webs not to catch a grace indeed but to get her away from that old spider scrope and many's the word and the scrap of paper that would go into her grace right under the very noses of my lord scrope and sir francis themselves as they sat at their chess in the queen's chamber it's a long game of chess that the two queens are playing but thank our lady and the saints it's not mate yet not mate yet and the white queen will win please god before the board's overturned and he told them too of the failure of the northern rebellion and the wretchedness of the fugitives they rode over the moors to liddesdale he said ladies and all in bitter weather wind and snow day after day with stories of clinton's troopers all about them and scarcely time for a bite or sup or sleep my lady northumberland was so overcome with weariness and sickness that she could ride no more at last and had to be left at john of the side's house where she had a little chamber where the snow came in at one corner and the rats ran over my lady's face as she lay my lords northumberland and westmoreland were in worse case and spent their christmas with no roof over them but what they could find out in the brazen woods about harla and no clothes but the foul rags that some beggar had thrown away and no food but a bird or a rabbit that they could pick up here and there or what their friends could get to them now and again privately and then my lord northumberland's little daughters whom he was forced to leave behind at topcliffe a sweet christmas they had their money and food was soon spent they could have scarcely a fire in that bitter hard season and god who feeds the ravens alone knows how they were sustained and for entertainment to make the time pass merrily all they had was to see the hanging of their own servants in scores about the house who had served them and their father well and all their music at night was the howling of the wind in those heavily laden christmas trees and the noise of the chains in which the men were hanged mr stuart's narratives were engrossing to the two ladies and sir nicholas they had never come so close to the struggles of the catholics in the north before and although the northern rebellion had ended so disastrously yet it was encouraging although heart-breaking too to hear that delicate women and children were ready gladly to suffer such miseries if the religious cause that was so dear to them could be thereby helped sir nicholas as has been said was in two minds as to the lawfulness of rising against a temporal sovereign in defence of religious liberties his whole english nature revolted against it and yet so many spiritual persons seemed to favour it his simple conscience was perplexed but none the less he could listen with the most intense interest and sympathy to these tales of these co-religionists of his own who were so clearly convinced of their right to rebel in defence of their faith and so with such stories the august afternoon passed away it was a thundery day which it would have been pleasanter to spend in the garden but that sir nicholas said under the circumstances was not to be thought of so they threw the windows wide to catch the last breath of air 
and the smell of the flower garden came sweetly up and flooded the low cool room and so they sat engrossed until the evening supper was ordered for mr stewart at half-past seven o'clock and this meal sir nicholas had consented should be laid downstairs in his own private room opening out of the hall and that he and his ladies should sit down to table at the same time mr stewart went to his room an hour before to dress for riding and to superintend the packing of his saddle-bags and at half-past seven he was conducted downstairs by sir nicholas who insisted on carrying the saddle-bags with his own hands and they found the two ladies waiting for them in the panelled study that had one window giving upon the terrace that ran along the south of the house above the garden when supper had been brought in by sir nicholas own body-servant mr boyd they sat down to supper after a grace from sir nicholas the horses were ordered for nine o'clock chapter six